Hello, hello. Um, so um, today I'm going to give you two examples. I'm going to show you two bodies of work, two photographic series um, that I've developed over the past decade. And the reason why I want to show you two examples is to make one simple point, and that's to say that there's never one representation that can kind of say it all. And it is really in the multiplying of stories of representations related to one topic um, that we can begin to kind of counter certain uh, kind of in, in deep and grounded stereotypes. And so I have focused on talking about topics related to aging. And photography is, I, you know, it's my main tool. Um, and I think of photography as a way to kind of engage with my surroundings. I use it as a tool to meet new people, to try and look at things in new ways, and to try and challenge myself as well, to, to really get into a way of, of engaging with my, my own surroundings, the society that I'm part of. And population, I mean, we all use photography as a tool today, not just in our mobile phones, but we use photography as a tool to understand and negotiate our own identities, to kind of see who we are and, 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 and also to process um, phenomena such as aging. And speaking of aging, population aging has been happening for uh, a long time. It's not something new and it's a phenomenon that has been going on, but the reason why I'm mentioning it is because um, in 2020, the European population will consist of 25% of, of elderly people over 60 years old. And this is a massive uh, change in the population structure, um, which will affect uh, the way that uh, society kind of functions not only on an individual level, but also on the kind of more social welfare state systems. And um, it also makes it, in, you know, it, this idea of aging into a political question today, because there will be a large um, pool of voters of a certain age. So I've been, I've been looking at different topics over many years, and I think the reason why I chose to do it is because since we're living in a society that is so much based on this idea that we use visual references in order to understand what we are part of, if we live in a society where we don't have any visual references, this is something that we need to kind of... Um, how is this going to Im impact us? How is it going to um, affect the way that we actually understand a notion? And these ideas prompt me to spend three years photographing in a geriatric ward in France, which is home to elderly people with Alzheimer's disease. And getting access to this hospital uh, was really just the first part, but it allowed me to get um, a kind of a lived account, a, a, a first-hand account of what life within an institution might actually mean. And um, um, the residents in this specific ward, which is called um, a Protective um, Ward. It's ruled according to the principle of precaution, which is a medical policy that most of us will probably never have heard of. But the principle of precaution essentially um, means that because of the nature of a specific disease, having a tendency to wander about and potentially get lost, which is a serious um, thing that we need to kind of address, the residents within the ward are uh, confined, meaning that you have a locked door that, that separates them from the rest of the hospital. And um, ruling you know, according to this principle of precaution, the residents are free to move around within the ward, but due to a lack of activities and a limited amount of carers in the ward, they're also kind of left to themselves. And this door becomes the center of attention, which causes an obstruction and, and, and makes the residents question it, and which means that there could be a, quite a lot of time 
every day focusing on, on, on this obstruction. And they also try and attempt to kind of force it open. Um, so I'm um, just going to go through a few of these slides. So while giving a vision of what life in a geriatric ward might mean, I mean, in a way, it's conveniently hidden from us because uh, as we go about our everyday lives, we don't necessarily want to think about these things. Um, my, I tend to try and always kind of center my work around the body, and um, the idea of, of focusing on the body is also meaning that we are confronting uh, certain problematic elements. This idea of a failing body is something that we in the West don't seem to be able to accept. So, um, que you know, I <laughs> natural phenomena such as disease, aging and dying represent big taboos today, um, which makes it very hard for us to confront visually. Um, and I think for a lot of reasons, I try to just give a visual account of a phenomenon that we are um, needing to face today. And while giving a vision of what aging in, a, in an institution might mean, I'm also very keen to really point out that this is a specific ward. Um, although this medical um, policy is really you know, implemented throughout Europe and the Western world, um, every ward is of course unique and special. And I think the problem with photography sometimes is that we, uh, it has this really I immediate, um, it's grabbing something from real, the real world and it's making it into something else. And it is in this transition where sometimes ideas such as representation and truth become problematic. And um, this is why I think we need a multi to multiply, really, our, our accounts when talking about a subject. And I was prompted to, to really think about these notions. Oops. Um, and and also kind of maybe to push it, because images and words are um, symbolic representations that are processed in different parts of the human brain. And so um, scientists believe that the part that processes the visual information is evolutionary older than the part that, that processes words. So therefore, images should be allowed to, to really evoke a deeper sense of, of emotion and affect us more deeply. So with this in mind, when we're using photographs, why try to use them to try to kind of write in images? Don't we fail to kind of exploit the, the real power of the photographic tool if we do that? So as I was kind of confronted with these feelings, because essentially as this project was published and, and exhibited ac across different countries, I was also, I was pleased because I was allowed to kind of able to encourage a debate. But at the same time, I also felt like I was complying with certain media rules related to talking about the elderly, since this topic was essentially kind of depressing and, and sort of negative. Um, and I was really trying to find ways of, of questioning, you know, to myself as well, was a, a way for me to nuance the picture, despite the fact of wanting to make a very specific point about a specific situation. And so my, my solution was really to try and just make several stories, um, which brought me here to these two individuals. Uh, it might be a long shot, but I'm trying to explain. Um, Madi and Monette Malrou are identical twins, and they live in Paris. I first saw them on the streets of Paris, and I was immediately fascinated by their um, 
kind of obviously in identical clothes, synchronized body language. And um, I, I found them really fascinating in, in, in the way that they kind of stood out from any crowd. They seemed to really enjoy the attention that they were getting. And Madi and Manette have spent their whole lives uh, uh, being performers, but in later years, they've kind of turned uh, a performing element and brought it into their everyday lives. So if you walk the streets of Paris, don't be surprised to, um, to come across this vision. Um, and Madine Monette, I mean, uh, I, I, I approached them and gradually we have begun to, to collaborate and to work together. And um, uh, Madine Monette often reject many of my ideas and that's completely fine because I want um, this account to kind of represent their own vision of themselves in the world. And I um, also because this idea of performing is really a part of their everyday uh, life now, and they also kind of have turned their own image into their profession as they work for advertising and they do play roles in films. I wanted to have them pose for me as a natural part of the project. And the streets of Paris, it serves as a kind of a, 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 a confusing element referencing, um, uh, you know, having all sorts of references to Paris, and film and art and fashion, which makes this mixture of, of having pictures of them going about their everyday business um, and me just, folk, you know, having photographs more set up. Um, it, we're creating this space um, in between and uh, which makes the kind of documentation of everyday events somewhat surreal. Now the question is, why is it surreal? And one answer is kind of obvious. Of course it makes us really uh, fascinating for us, as Madi and Manette would call us um, singular people, to witness how one identity sort of expands across two bodies. And um, it makes us uh, really enter into a conversation with ourselves and makes us aware of the limitations of our own identity and how we're kind of constantly in conversation with ourselves. However, there's another um, part of this work that I find um, important to point out, and it is that really in the layering of um, performance or fiction, Madi and Manette are creating a space where we as viewers can confront difficult topics or a difficult topic such as, you know, having this body kind of aging and slowly maybe meeting this notion of, of, of maybe not being around anymore, dare I say it, um, dying. Um, but as they do it, the kind of the, the duo that they have created, the identical clothes, the synchronized body language, the amount of humor that they kind of present themselves with, allow us to confront difficult notions and to kind of un, you know, sidestep these, these pre preconceptions that we kind of unconsciously employ as we see a woman of a certain age on the streets. So since they kind of really have found a way to sidestep this, they also invite us into a place, a safe place, where we are allowed to think of difficult topics without, without this notion of, of, of fear or difficulty. And this was something that I wanted to really achieve. And of course, Madi and Monette say that they do it for the humor. They really enjoy <laughs> you know, receiving attention. And I think um, as I come in and I, I kind of reinforce the message that they have put on, the show that they put on themselves, as I reinforce it, I also allow them to reach a, a, a larger audience in many ways. And performity and photography is often kind of considered um, two notions of, you know, two different spectrums. Uh, one being a live medium and the other one being a static object. But if you think of the photograph as a performance, um, a speech act or a conversation, 
then um, you can be allowed to focus on what the photograph actually does and how it affects its viewer. And I think that this is an important notion that we need to take with us today when um, you know, so much of the world focuses around our, you know, image sharing and image making. And I think the, 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 the real challenge for me as, a, as an image maker today is to find ways to enter into conversation with a wide audience about these difficult topics because we really need to try and find ways to um, talk about taboos and difficult subjects. Um, and in order to kind of really disarm them and to engage with them. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you. <laughs>